so here is the first question. Um, so, so f of x equals the absolute value of one over x and g of x equals x cubed plus three x minus three. Find the following f f of x. So f of f of x, what are you doing? You're solving this in itself. So basically what this will look like is like if you're doing f of one over x. What does that mean? It means anywhere you find an x in the formula, you have to sub that in. So you'll end up with one absolute value of absolute value of one over x. And then when you divide a whole number by a fraction, this flips and gets multiplied into the one. So basically what you end up, what you'll end up with just the absolute value of x. That's what the answer for that is. Um, one divided by one over x, just in case you didn't follow what I said. So this is your division sign here. So this means one times x over one, which gives you just x. And that's what I get that from. How about g f of negative two? So the best way to do this, find f of negative two first, which is absolute value of one over negative two, you sub a negative two n for x. So the absolute value of negative one half, it just gives you positive one half and that's your answer. Now that's the answer of f of negative two though. Now you do a g of f of negative two, which is we found out it was one half, which equals one half cubed. So basically you're subbing that into now the g of x and all the x's in here, cubed plus six, times one half minus three. Now one half cubed is one eighth. If you're wondering how just one cubed is one and two cubed is eight. Six times a half is three. When you multiply a, a whole number times fraction, if you could divide the number by the fraction, of, of, if you could divide the number by the bottom of the fraction, do had six divided by two is three. That's what three times one is three. So that's how you do it. Uh, and then minus three, this positive three and negative three will cancel. You get one eighth as your answer. So here is uh, question number two, divide using long division or synthetic division and write it in the form given um, by the division algorithm. So here, if you have a choice between long division and synthetic division, definitely go for synthetic division a lot faster, a lot easier. Okay, so in synthetic division, what you wanna do, you wanna do this. Now you put in all your coefficients in here. So negative three, negative four, seven, and four. Let's say there was a degree that's missing. Let's say that there was no negative four X squared to jump, just jump from negative X cubed plus seven X plus four. Then the X squared, you have to make up the coefficient with a zero. So you'll go negative one, zero, seven, four. That's in, ca that's in case there was no, this wasn't there. Uh, but here you have the whole uh, descending order of degrees. So you just list all your coefficients. So negative one, negative four, seven, and four. Now you're dividing by X plus three. What you put here, you put negative three. That's what you're dividing by. Synthetic division works like this. So what you do, the first thing you do, bring the negative one right here, multiply the negative one times negative three, you get positive three, write that there, you add, you get negative one. And you continue doing the same thing. So here, negative one times negative three gives you positive three. You add, you get 10. 10 times negative three is negative 30. You add, you get negative 26. This is the remainder. So this will give you a uh, negative x cubed minus four x squared plus seven x divided by x plus plus four divided by x plus three equals negative x squared minus x plus 10. And these are the coefficients right here, right there, right there. So negative one x squared minus one x plus 10 plus a remainder of 
negative 26. And that should be your answer. So here is a question, um, re rewrite two log x plus half log five minus one third log three brackets x plus two as a single log logarithm statement. So a few things, maybe I'll, I'll just remind you of the log rules. If you have log x to the n equals n log x. So basically you could bring the exponent down or it could uh, like here, or you could go from here to there and bring the exponent up. So this the relations works back and forth. Uh, also log x, y is the same as log x plus log y. So you're able to convert from here to there or from there to there as needed in the question. And then also log x over y equals log x minus log y. And these are the tools that you need for this question. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna bring all the exponents up. That's the first thing you need to do when you're doing this kind of questions, log x squared plus log five to the power of one half minus log um, x plus two to the power of one third. Now you want to use these two here to put to, to, to rewrite them as one single logarithm. So there you go, log. Anything that has a positive in the front here, I tell my students, and if you see a positive in here, that means these things that you log in, they go on top. So five to the half, which is square, same as square root of five, x squared goes on top and anything that has a negative goes on the bottom and this here will go to the, on the bottom as x plus two to the one third. Also one third is the same as the cube root if you wanna write it as a cube root, but I don't think you need to bother. This answer will be good enough uh, for a full mark. Okay, so that's the answer for that one. So here is this question right here, a sketch or given the sketch of f of x drawn below, sketch the following functions. So here they want you to sketch f of x minus two. So here means your graph moved two to the right. That's what this does. So when you have f of x minus two, this translation here is, it's a horizontal translation. And it means you're moving two to the right. If this was plus two, then you move two to the left. Yeah, so the first thing you wanna do, you wanna, I'm gonna plot this right on the same grid rather than in here. So the first thing you move your asymptote, you have a vertical asymptote, move it two to the right. So your asymptote will be right here. Now take each point, move it two to the right. So this is on the half. So you go there and then you go there and you have that. This is one, two, you go right there. This is one, two, right there. And this is one, two, right there. Um, and then, you know, you're getting very close to the vertical asymptote, you never touch it. So basically you have that kind of graph, basically. Okay, so this is how your graph looks like when you're doing that kind of translation. Now, the next thing, so this is done, then I'm gonna do the next thing, which is, so the next thing they want me to plot y equals the absolute value of f of x plus two. So if I'm doing that, the order of operations here is you have to do the absolute value to the function first. So the absolute value, what it does, it takes anything on this graph below the x-axis and reflects it into the x-axis, only the stuff that's below. So this here, this point is at negative one, it becomes at one. Uh, and so what's happening, you'll have that kind of thing. And that's the reflection of your point. So basically what happened is your graph reflected that way. I mean, so what, that's what's happening to the graph. What absolute value does, takes all your y values and make them positive if they're negative. If they're positive already, it doesn't do anything to them. So this point is like it's at negative one and, uh, or sorry, it's at negative 
this point is at negative half and negative one. So it becomes at uh, the, the X value stays negative half, but the Y value becomes positive one and all of these. So basically think of, think of it, anything below the X axis reflects into the X axis. The top stays where it is. Now, after this, what you want to do, you take all the points here and move them two up since this is moved two up after the absolute value. So you take this point right here, one, two, you move it up to, take this point, one, two, you move it up to, and then take this point, one, two, move it up to, take that point, move it up to. So what's happening, your final graph would look more like this. And so this you don't need anymore. Okay, oh, yeah. how about if they change the question. I'm just gonna put a little bit of uh, twist to this. And um, if we make it y equals f of x plus two absolute valued like this. If they do that, then you have to move this graph two up before you start doing the absolute value. So this point will move two up. So you'll have basically if um, I'm just gonna erase the answer for the question here. And I'm gonna show you like if it was, um, if it was asked that way, then you go this, you have to, you have to the order of operations here, you move everything to up first. So this goes there, this goes there, this goes there, and this will go there. So what you have, you have that kind of, A graph, you know, and so what do you do? This will stay the same, and this portion right here will reflect starting right there. So that's how it would look like if it, that was the case. So kind of a bit different from the previous one because here you do absolute value and then two up. That's the order, but here you have to do two up and then the absolute value. Treat the absolute value as brackets. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question. So here's a question, they give you a graph and they want you to sketch the transformations. There are three parts. The first one, they want you, if this is y equals f of x, then they want you to sketch y equals negative half f of x. Now, a half in front of the whole function means vertical compression by a half, which indicates you multiply the y value by, by the factor, which is one half. And the negative in front of the whole function means it's a reflection in the x-axis. So you know what, I'm gonna take those four points right here, which is the first one, zero and negative uh, three, and then two and negative one, and four and negative three, and the point one, two, three, four, five, and five and three. So vertical compression, you multiply, you multiply the Y. So you multiply the Y value by the half. So here, your zero and negative three becomes zero and negative 1.5. When you reflect over the X axis, you change the sign of Y. So basically this, this becomes 1.5. Now let's go to the next thing. Two and negative one becomes two and two and negative 0.5. And as we said, the reflection in the x-axis, it changes the sign of the Y value only. So it becomes two and 0.5. This becomes four and negative 1.5 and you change the sign of that y as you reflect over the x-axis, so it becomes four and 1.5. Uh, 
and then the last one is five and 1.5 and then it becomes five and negative 1.5 because the reflection over the x-axis, it changes the sign of the y value. So let's plot all of these questions. So let's plot all of these points. Uh, this is your final points that you have to plot. So zero and 1.5 is around here. Now 2 and 0.5, 2 and 0.5 is right here. And then 4 and 1.5, 4 and 1.5 is right here. Oops, 4 and 1.5 is just uh, right there, sorry. And then 5 and 1, negative 1.5, 5 and negative 5 and negative 1.5 is right here. So what we have now, we have this, we have this, and we have this. So this is how your graph looks like. As you see, it's vertically compressed. It's not as long vertically anymore. And the points have been flipped. So uh, instead of going this way, now it's going that way kind of thing. Okay. Let me go to the next thing. Just gonna clear all of that. So the next thing they want you to plot y equals f of negative 2x. So they throw a negative 2 in front of the x here. What this means, it means the 2 in front of the x, now it's horizontal compression by 1 half. So as you see, when the numbers with the x, you do the exact reciprocal of the number. Uh, so if it's a two there, you go one half, but if you put, let's say one third in front of that, then you know, it's horizontal expansion by three when it's horizontal. And the negative in front there is a reflection in the y-axis. Yeah. Um, if, when the negative is in front of the x instead of here, it's a reflection in the y-axis. Now let's take my points again. Uh, they are zero and negative three, two and, um, sorry, two and negative one, four and negative three, and then we have five and positive three. So here, what we're gonna do, we're gonna take these points here, horizontal compression by half, you multiply the X value. When it's horizontal, you multiply the X value by the factor. So half times zero, just zero. So it's gonna be zero and negative three. And then a reflection over the Y axis. When you reflect over the Y axis, let's say if you reflect this point over the Y axis, the only thing that changes is the X sign. So that if it's positive, it becomes negative, but since this point is right on the y-axis. It doesn't reflect. So basically, it stays at 0 and negative 3. This one, you multiply the x value by a half. 2 times a half is 1 and negative 1. And then when you reflect it, we said with reflection over the y-axis, you change the sign of x. So this becomes negative 1, and the y stays the same. Um, here, half times 4 is 2. So you have 2 and negative 3. Reflection, you change the sign of the x but the y stays the same. And then the last one, we have 2.5 and three. Since it's a reflection on the y axis, it changes the sign of x. So it becomes negative 2.5 and three. And therefore now we plot, this is the points, that's my final answer that, or my final transformation for all the points that I'm gonna transfer. So zero and negative three stays as zero and negative three. So it's invariant point, it doesn't change. And, and, and we have negative one and negative one. 
and we have negative two and negative three. And we have the last point is negative 2.5 and three. So negative 2.5 and three will be right there. And so now my graph would look like this. So as you see, it's reflected over uh, uh, the y-axis and also it's compressed by a, by a half. Yeah, so this is that for this. And we'll move on to the last thing. Now what we're gonna do, I think the next question, which always asked and on the exams and tests is the inverse. So y equals f to the negative one of x just means graph the inverse of this. Let me get rid of the um, graph right here. So graphing the inverse is the easiest thing because there's not a lot of work that you have to do except take the points, flip them, switch the X and the Y. That's all you need to do. Simple, isn't it? Negative three and four and three and five. Go plot your points right here. Negative three and zero is right there. Negative one and two is right there. Negative three and four is right there. And three and five is right there. Now you could see how this is going to look like. So basically what you have, you have this, you have this and you have this basically this is the inverse also remember the inverse is a reflection in the line the the um, diagonal line y equals x. So the mirror becomes this line instead of the x-axis or the y-axis as you notice, you know, this bang, 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 and there is kind of thing. So that's the, that's where this graph is reflected in the y equals x line. That's what, what the inverse says. Okay, let's move on to the next question. So they want you to find the fifth term in this expansion. So the general formula or the formula that you have to remember is this. So if you have A plus B to the power of N and you need to expand this or find terms from this expansion, it's DK plus one equals NCK A to the N minus K B to the K. Okay. So most important is to define your terms right here. So A in my case is X and B is one. N is the exponent right on top equals eight. K is the tricky part. It's not really tricky, but this is, you have to get this right to be able to find this question, okay? So they want to find the fourth term, okay? For the fourth term, you know how I have TK plus one? I want this to read for the fourth term. I must make K three for this to read T four, because if I make K three, then three plus one is four, and this will read T four. So that's the trick right there. So therefore now I'm just gonna start filling in my equation, T three plus one equals uh, eight, choose three, A, which is X to the N minus three. So that's eight minus three, sorry, eight N minus K, which is eight minus three, and then B, which is the one, to the power of k, which is three. So t, t4 equals eight c3, I'll find that out in my calculator, but x to the five because eight minus three is five and one to the power three is just one. So you don't have to write that. So now we're just gonna go ahead and find what eight, um, um, So eight choose three gives you 56. So the answer for this is 56 X cubed. And that's 
it for this question right here. Um, we'll move on to the next question. So there you go. There are nine boys and 11 girls in grade 12 English class. In how many ways can five students be chosen for a group project in the group must have three female members and two male members. So basically they made that condition for you right there. So, and you wanna choose five students, three of them are females and two are males. So basically what you need to do, you, go, you need to go to the nine boys and to choose two males, you have to choose two from the nine boys and means multiply by from the 11 girls, you're gonna choose three. That's what you're doing. Uh, and the difference between permutations and combinations are like that. If you want to learn permutation order matters, combination order doesn't matter. So uh, here, if I choose three girls and I choose Emily, Sarah, and Lisa, it doesn't matter what order I say them in, they just mean one thing. It's not like well, we're choosing three different people for three different jobs, then order matters. But here, because it's a, um, a group, for a project, but it doesn't matter what those it is. And that's why we're using combinations instead of permutations. So then you just go to your calculator, nine, choose two. Which is 36 times 11, choose three. One sixty five which equals 5,940 ways of doing this. Next question. Here's a question, we're getting into trigonometry, my favorite subject. Um, I'm not kidding. Okay, um, so 1,265, Convert that to radians. When you're converting to radius, you multiply by pi over 180. If you're converting radians to degrees, you multiply by the reciprocal of that. So one, two, six, five times pi. And they want the answer in exact values. So what you do, you take the one, two, six, five divided by 180 and start reducing till you get your um, final reduction there and I think this will give you 253 pi over 36. Make sure if they ask you for exact values not to give them decimal. If you if you go uh, that and your calculator multiplied by pi and you get a decimal and you write that, that's not going to be accepted. You're not going to get the one mark for that. They might give you half the mark or they might give you zero. So just make sure exact values they wanted and this should just keep on reducing all the way till the lowest terms and give them that final answer right there. Now, you know the sin or sine alpha is negative two over seven, alpha is between pi and three pi over two. Also, you know P of beta is in quadrant four and cos beta equals four over five, five fine sine alpha plus beta. Let's start breaking this little by level. So let's worry about alpha first. Alpha is between pi and three pi over two. You know pi is right here and three pi over two is right there. Now on that zero, two pi, uh, pi over two, sorry, right there and, and two pi all the way around when you go this way. So your triangle is supposed to be right here. You draw that triangle right there. You throw your alpha as your reference angle right there. And then just label according to the sign. Sign is opposite over hypotenuse. So they're telling you that opposite is negative two and the hypotenuse seven. Just always know the hypotenuse is always positive. Never put a negative sign with the hypotenuse. Now, what you need to do, you need to use Pythagoras to find the third side here. And Pythagoras tells me that that third side will be seven squared minus two squared. Yes, it's negative two, but in squared, it becomes positive anyway. So 749 minus four, that is giving me 45, square root of 45, which is nine times five and the square root of nine is three. So this would be three root five. And if you write this only, then you made a mistake because you have to write negative here since the x-axis here is negative. Now, 
they say in beta is in quadrant four. So you know what? I'm gonna draw beta on the same grid. It's in here. So I'm maybe just solid line right there. This is the 90. I'm gonna make this beta right there. It's always between the terminal arm. We call this the terminal arm and the x-axis. And the cosine is four over five. The cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So four over five that way. Now let's fi find the other side. Pythagoras is really easy, guys. Just go square root of five squared since you're finding the side and not the uh, high, not the hypotenuse. Then you go to hypotenuse squared minus the given side squared. So minus four squared. And 25 minus 16 is nine. Nine square root of nine is three. If you write only three, then you got it wrong. You have to write that negative sign since the y axis here is negative. Now they're saying what's sine alpha plus beta? So sine alpha plus beta. Don't just go, okay, sine alpha is negative two over seven, sine beta is negative three over five. No, this is an addition identity. The addition identity, you have to change it into sine alpha cos beta plus sine beta cos alpha. Some students, they see that here written cos alpha sine beta first, it doesn't matter. Both of them are the same. So um, because just you write them backwards and some of the identity sheets that you have. So sine alpha, that is negative two over seven times cos beta, which is um, four over five plus sine beta, which is negative uh, oh, sine beta is four over five, uh, sorry. So sine beta is negative three over five, so plus negative three over five. And cos alpha is times negative three root five over seven. Now this will give me negative eight over 35. Negative times negative is positive. So that's, I'm just gonna have the plus there. Three times three is nine. So this will give me nine root five over 35. Highly recommend that you write this as one common denominator, which is 35. And then you have the negative eight plus nine root five. And that is your final answer. So I will just check really fast. So beta cos that's four over five. That's gonna be negative three. And this and sine alpha is negative two over seven, cos beta is four over five, sine beta is negative three over five, and cos alpha is negative three root five over seven. And then, yeah, we, we, we got it right. All right, let's move on to the next question. So here is the question polynomials, determine the end behavior of the function. Uh, one mark, find all X and Y intercepts. Uh, so there we go. I'm gonna start with this. I'm gonna answer this as the last thing because the way I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you how to graph it first rather than using memory work. I want you to look how the graph would look like and then you could tell what the end behavior is. So let's do the X intercepts first, the X intercepts. X equals one, negative three and seven, and all of them are multiplicity of ones because there's no square on top or a cube on top of the brackets. Okay, so these are your X intercepts. Your Y intercepts, maybe you'll, you'll have to do a little bit of work. So here are the X intercepts. The Y intercept would be F of, you make X zero minus, when you throw in zero for all of the axes, you're just gonna get negative one times three times negative seven. So negative times negative times negative is gonna be a negative. And final answer for the Y intercept is 21. So the X intercepts are one, negative three and seven, and my Y intercept is negative 21. And therefore now five, 10, 15, 20, 25, that's negative 25, that's negative 20 right there. So my Y intercept would be here around there. And then this is my X intercepts right there. So when the leading coefficient here is negative, that means you go to the zero on the furthest right and you go down. If the zero is positive, then 
if, if the leading coefficient is positive, then you go to the zero at the first to the right and go up. Since here, the leading coefficient is negative, I'm just gonna go down. And then what you do, you go and then you come back and go through that zero again. And I think you just go through, 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 and then you have to go back and go to that zero again and go right through it, yeah. Because all of these are multiplicity of one, you could ju you just go through the zero. Let's say if there was a, a multiplicity of two where you have uh, in, the bra in the brackets, the zero will have a square on top, then you'll balance and all of that. I did that in other lessons. But this is how this graph looks like. Now, and behavior, once you graph it, you say, as X goes to negative infinity, Y goes to infinity. Because as we go, that means as we go this way, my graph is shooting up high to positive infinity. That's what it means, x going to negative infinity, y goes to infinity. And as x goes to infinity, okay, as x goes to positive infinity, that means as we go this way to positive infinity, the y value on the graph shoots down to negative infinity. And that's what the end behavior is. This is it for this graph and um, or this question, and we'll go to the next one. Here is an exponential graph. If I want to write this in a bit differently, I could write it as y equals negative 3 to the power of x plus 9. Maybe some students like seeing it that way. So they want me to state the x-intercept, the equation of asymptote. and the range. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna go ahead and plot the x-axis. And the y-axis. So this is the x, this is the y. I'm gonna scale by, here I think I'm just gonna say scale by one, two, three, four, negative one, negative two, negative three, and so on, negative four. Here, however, I'm gonna scale by two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, and so on. So here it's also negative, negative two, negative four, negative six, negative eight, negative 10. Now with exponential graphs, usually y equals three, th y equals three to the x. When x is one, y would be three. And when x is zero, y will be one. And, and when y is two, it would be, sorry, when X is two, Y would be nine. So you, your mother graph looks like this. Okay, and here's one, two, three important points if you wish. Okay, uh, that's zero and one, like this is Y equals three to the X, just so you know. And then if you make X one, then three to the power of one is three. So when X is one, Y is three. And when X is two, Y is nine. Now, the first thing that happened, this graph moved. It's been reflected. So this, this if you look at this, compared to this, you have a reflection in the X axis. And you move nine up, up nine. So when you move up nine, what's gonna happen to your asymptote, which is the x-axis, is also gonna move nine up. So it's gonna be going where nine is, and that is where your asymptote is gonna be at nine. So that's my new x-axis kind of thing. Okay, so my equation of asymptote is y equals nine. Now, after that, if you wanna, do these points right here, you reflect them over the x-axis, so that goes, that goes right there, and then you go nine up, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, so your point goes right there. And if I'm, I'm just gonna do it in a different color, so that's your point. And then this point would reflect in the y-axis, 
sorry, and this point will reflect in the x-axis, so it goes right there, and it moves one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine up, so it goes right there. This point will reflect in the y, in the x-axis, sorry, and then goes up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and it will be right there. So what's happening, your graph now is gonna start looking like this. This is how the graph is gonna look like. Yeah, so this is how to graph it with transformations. And the range would be y has to be less than nine for the range because the graph almost touches nine, but it never does and it goes down forever this way. The x-intercept, I notice I got my x-intercept right there, that's at two. Okay. Now, how about if we calculate the x-intercept rather than uh, finding it through the graph? So if I wanna find the x-intercept by plugging, you know, whenever you find the x-intercept, you plug in zero for y and you have negative three to the power of x equals uh, plus nine. So I'm gonna move the negative three to the power of x to the other side, so three to the x equals positive nine and therefore x equals two. And that's how you could algebraically find what the x-intercept is. Now for some people, they like to find the equation of the asymptote with this. And then what they do, they like doing table of values. So I'm just gonna show you that right here if you wanna do table of values, x, y, maybe start at zero one and two and see what you get. So we're gonna work from here. So zero, three to the power of zero is one. That makes it negative one plus nine is eight. So we have a point at zero and eight, as you see, it's right there. And if you wanna plug in one, that's three to the one is three. That makes it negative, negative three plus nine is six. So you have a point at one and six. Yes, you have a point at one and six. And then if you sub in two, two, three squared is nine. That makes a negative nine plus nine is zero, so that gives me two and zero, and that's your point right there. So this is another way, if you wanna use table of values to solve this. Um, next question. So here we go, they want you to graph f of x equals log base three x minus two. I think it's a good idea to know y equals log base three X and how it looks like. And then after that, the only thing that happens to this graph, it's moving down two. So let's go and explore that. What I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna plot this right here. So we have the X axis, the Y axis. So this is X, this is Y. If I was to plot this Y equals log base three X, when X is three, this would be log base three, three, log base three, three is one. And when, if I make X one, three to the power of what equals one, three to the power of zero. So we have a point right here. And if you, you could go all the way to nine, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, that would be two. Because if you make X nine, then log base three, nine, three to the power of what equals nine, that's two. Also, you could do change of base, you know, log X over log three, if you like using your calculator, then sub in one here for the X, you get, log one, which is zero, zero divided by log three is just gonna give you zero. And then if you put in uh, log uh, three there over log three is gonna give you one. And then, so this is just, you could use a calculator using a change of base, you know, it's called the change of base where we could use the calculator. Um, so the mother graph, which is log base three X is a graph that looks like this, you know, um, with these graphs is that the, the, um, the um, sorry about that. It's the X, the Y axis is the asymptote. So the domain with this is X is greater than zero with the mother graph. Now what happened with the other graph right here, it says it moved down too. So basically that's not, it's not gonna affect my 
vertical asymptotes because if it moves down to, it doesn't affect it. So I move this point down to, I move this point down to, I move this point down to, and then my graph would still get very close to the X axis. Sorry, gets very close to the Y axis and it goes through that point and it keeps on going that way. So that's all that's happening to the graph. If, if I was to write the equation of asymptote, it will be x equals zero because my y-axis is x equals zero. That's what I get close to, but I never touch. Here, the domain, because the range is all real numbers, so they'll test you on the domain. The domain will be x is greater than zero because the graph starts after the y-axis and it keeps on going that way. The x-intercept equals nine because if you put nine right there, log base three, nine gives you two because three to the power of two gives you nine. So that log base three, nine will give you two, two minus two is zero. And that's how you get the x-intercept. And that's how you graph this kind of question. So I think it's a better idea to graph the mother graph. I think it's a good idea to graph the parent graph and then do down two because this is just down two right here. Next question. So here is another graph and it's a good idea to know parent graph again, y equals root x. And if you, this, this one compared to this, you have vertical expansion times two and up four. That's what you have two times the whole root of X means vertical expansion by two. And then this is up four. So let's just uh, maybe go one, two, three, four, five, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five. So y equals square root of x. Um, when x is zero, the square root of zero is zero. When x is one, so I'm just gonna put some numbers right here. When x is one, square root of one is one. When x is four, square root of four is two right there. So the parent graph looks like this. And here x has to be greater than or equal to zero because you cannot square root negative numbers. So there's nothing on this side of the uh, y axis. Now, vertical expansion by two and then four up, zero and zero, you multiply the y by two, it doesn't do anything. And then you move one, two, three, four up. So it stays right there. Now this here, you move, you multiply the y value by two. So one and one becomes one and two, and then you move up four, one, two, three, four. So it goes right there. And then this one, uh, four and two, when you multiply the y value by, this is four and two right here. When you multiply the y value by two, it becomes four and four, which is right there. And then it moves one, two, three, four up and it goes right there to, and then this is how my graph will look like. So this is the transformation of y equals root x to g of x equals two root x plus four. Yeah. Um, if you want to show the points, uh, so you, uh, <clears throat> you know how I have zero and zero as my first point right here. So vertical expansion by two just stays zero and zero and then up four it becomes zero and four. And then my other point, which is one and one, it becomes one and two because you multiply the Y value by two and then you move up four. So it becomes one and six because you add the four to the two. And then my last point, which is the uh, four and two that I was transforming, you multiply the Y value by two. So it becomes four and four and then you move four up, it becomes four and eight. Eight, and these are your final points, what you see right there. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Here's another question they gave me, the, the, the line or the, the, the function f of x, that's how the graph looks like, and they want me to graph the square root of f of x. So remember when you graphing y equals the square root of f of x, Anything below the x-axis, you cannot do it. So the first thing you do, you get rid of all of this. Why? Because the square root means we're square rooting the y value. And if you notice all the y values here are negative and you cannot square root negative numbers. So you, all, everything underneath there is gone. 
And what you have, you will have this point here, it'll stay the same because this point, the Y value is zero. And when you do that square root of zero stays zero. It doesn't matter what the X is, the X stays the same, but also we call this the invariant point. Um, so it looks at about 3.2 and zero. So it'll stay at 3.2 and zero. Now let's take a few points right here, this one, and I'm gonna take this one. So this point here is two and one. When you do the square root of that, what it becomes, you, the, the x stays the same and the square root the one, which stays the same. So it becomes two and one again, or it stays two and one. So this also is invariant point. So we have two invariant points here. How about we look at the negative two and four. So the point negative two and four, it becomes, uh, you square root the four, you only square root the y value, so it becomes negative two and two. And so that point will go right there. And therefore now my graph would look more like this. So this is the final graph for this. My invariant points are two and one. And this one, which looks like uh, 3.2 and zero. So these are the invariant points if they ask you. They didn't ask you to indicate what they are here, but uh, if they did, you could tell them it's about 2.3.2 uh, and zero. This is invariant, it didn't change. As you see, both graphs share that point and also two and one, both graphs share that point. And these are the only two points that the original graph f of x and the square root of f of x share these two points. Okay, let's move on to the next question. So here's the next question, solve this radical expression or radical equation algebraically. It's a um, check if you have any extraneous roots. So to solve this, the first thing I need to do, move the negative one to the other side. So I have one equals one half square root of X plus two. Now cross multiply the two in there. If you like cross multiply and do it that way or multiply half both sides, I cross multiply the two right there. And the two is gone and I have X plus two square both sides to get rid of the square root. So I'm just gonna throw a square here and a square there. So that's gonna give me four equals X plus two and then move the two to the other side. So four minus two equals X and therefore X equals two. Now check. So to check, I'll put half instead of X, I write the two there plus two minus one two plus two is four, square root of four is two, two times a half is one, one minus one gives you zero. Yes, this is the right answer. It's not extraneous and this is done. So here is rational functions. Um, so they want me to graph this, y equals four x over x minus one. Uh, pay attention to whether the graph should have a point of discontinuity or a vertical asymptote. So definitely this graph has a vertical asymptote at um, x equals one because you cannot have zero on the bottom. So x equals one is a vertical asymptote. If I wanna find my y-intercept, y-intercept, I sub in zero for Y, so I get, sorry, I sub in zero for X. And then I end up with zero on top and negative one on bottom, which gives me zero. So now I'm just gonna start plotting this here and seeing how things are gonna look like. So there you go, this is your X axis, this is your Y axis. X, Y, now my Y intercept is zero, so it's gonna be right there. My vertical asymptote is at one. There's no point of discontinuity. We have a vertical asymptote, the point of discontinuity when top and bottom, they cancel, they create a, a hole in the graph, but that's not the case here. Um, now, how about horizontal asymptotes? 
Horizontal asymptotes is very important for this graph because then you know how your graph looks like once you have a one point on either side of the asymptote, you know exactly what, what to do. So to find the horizontal asymptote, if you have one, yes, we do here. When you have the degree on top and the bottom are the same here, X to the one and here X to the one, then it's the coefficients of the top over the coefficient of the bottom. So here, your vert horizontal asymptote is y equals four because it's four times uh, four divided by one right there. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna scale by two, by, by, by twos here. So two, four, six, negative two, negative four, negative six kind of thing. So my horizontal asymptote is gonna be right there. Now, since I have a point right here, here, uh, and I have horizontal asymptote and vertical asymptote, this now becomes very simple because vertical asymptote I get very close to and I never touch. And horizontal asymptote also I get very close to, but I never touch. All right, now, if you wanna be more accurate, it looks most likely you'll have a point right here because this point is right there. So I'd have a point right there, but let's make sure that that's the case. So if I sub in this, y va this X value here is two. So if I sub in two for X, so four times two over two minus one, that gives me four times two, which is eight over one, which is eight. This point is two and we're scaling at the X value here. So we're scaling by two or three. So we're scaling by one on the X, on the X but we're scaling by um, two on the Y. So two and eight will be right there as I told you. But you could always, if that's not the case and you don't see this, just choose one point on the right side of the vertical, asymp uh, vertical asymptote. So the best thing, don't choose three, four, choose the, the the number that's closest to one, so which is two. And that indicates you have a point here, then you know you get very close to your horizontal asymptote right here and you get very close to your vertical asymptote right there. And this is how the graph looks like. This is as simple as it gets. Uh, just point of value, you know, uh, table of values with finding one point on the right side of the vertical asymptote and one point on the left side of the asymptote. This one I found it when I did my y-intercept, I had a point right there. Now knowing where my horizontal and vertical asymptotes are, I know how the graph looks like exactly with this easier ones right here. Okay, uh, let's go to the next question. So graph the following function when you have that kind of situation, definitely before you do anything, see if you could factor the bottom. And so this here will give me y equals x plus one, and the bottom factors into x minus five, x plus one. And because two numbers multiply to give me negative five and add to give me a negative four, these are what the numbers are. Now, this will cancel with this and I'll end up, I'll end up with y equals one over x minus five. So I have a point of discontinuity. So making sure my spelling is right. I am a mathematician, not a not a speller. Um, anyways, uh, so there you go. So y y equals one over x minus five. Since we have a point of discontinuity, the point of discontinuity is going to be at x equals negative one because that the, whatever cancel there gives me x equals negative one. Sub the negative one into the x here, so you have y equals one over negative one minus five, which gives me one over negative six or negative one over six. Negative one over six is somewhere around, okay, the point would be negative one and negative one six. So it will be negative one here and negative one six will be somewhere around there. So you'd have a point of discontinuity right at that point right there. Also we have, looking at this, we have a vertical asymptote at x equals five. So one, two, three, four, five. I think I'm just gonna scale by twos here to uh, six. So five would be right here. So I have a vertical asymptote right here. And then honestly, after this, your vertical as, do you have a horizontal asymptote? My horizontal asymptote, sorry, I'm all over the place here, is why equals zero. Why y equals zero? If the degree on top is, is less than the degree on the bottom, always y equals zero is your horizontal asymptote. So therefore my uh, y axis 
oh, sorry, my x my x axis is the is the horizontal asymptote. That's what y equals zero is. Since I have this point of discontinuity here, and I have a vertical asymptote and a horizontal asymptote, then I know my graph is doing this, getting close to that passes. So then just go like that and continue your graph right there. You want to find out what's happening on the right side of five or the the vertical asymptote on the right side. To choose a number close to five right here because this is x equals five, which I will choose six if I'm doing table of values. So I choose six x y. If I choose six for for x, then I go six minus five is one. One over one is gonna give me one. So therefore, I have a point at six and one. Okay, I'm scaling here by ones. Negative four, two, three, four. So therefore, I have a point at six and one. So there you go. And since I have this point here, and I have my horizontal asymptote as being the x-axis and the vertical asymptote is this, then I could just wing it, get very close to the x-axis and get very close to the vertical asymptote. And that is how my graph looks like. You know, I'm looking at this graph right now and it's, it's, it's looking kind of not symmetrical or, or, or on the asymptote. This is like this far away and this looks like, that's because I didn't do more points. But if I, if I do four as another point there, and I sub in the four there, four minus five is negative one. One divided by negative one is negative one. So I know at four and negative one, I should have a point right there. If you want a little bit more accuracy than what you do, just move this part right here. And kind of connect with right here. And then you get very close to that. And this way now it looks more symmetrical uh, if you know what I mean. So always table of values helps you. Like once you know your vertical asymptotes, always choose, even if you have one, more than one vertical asymptote, choose a point, an X value on the right side of the asymptote uh, uh, and an X value on the left side of the asymptote, you know, choose them very close. So if that, uh, uh, the uh, vertical asymptote is X equals five, then you choose four and six. And that will indicate where the points are gonna be uh, as coordinates. And then you have a bit of more accurate graph. This is how this looks like. Let's move on to the next question. So here is another question right here. And this question is logs. So logs, you have to know log base A, X equals B. You could change this into X equals A to the power of B. So this to the power of this equals this. So that's what I'm gonna do right here. I'm gonna say root two to the power of X equals 64. Don't worry about what the variables are. Just this is that format. You know, don't think this X should be there or anything like that. No, just this is this this is a rule that we, or a, one of the laws that we have to remember. Now, when I have this situation, I know this is this is the A here. X is the B, and uh, and 64 was where the X is. But anyway, so you change this to root two to the power of X equals 64. Root, I don't like the root, so I'm gonna write it as two to the power of half, and I still have the X there. And 64 could be written as two to the six, because two to the six give me 64. Now cancel the twos, half x equals six. Now x equals two times six is 12. And that's what the x value equals for that one. Uh, root two to the power of 12 will give you 64. Okay. So here it is, um, half of uh, the final exam is done. I think I'm gonna start it right here and leave the other half for uh, next time. Again, hit that like button, subscribe to my channel. Lots of good stuff is coming up. Um, thank you for watching. The next time, bye bye.